Welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. We believe life is about how we react. Hey, thank you for listening. This is episode 137, and it's a special one for a couple of reasons. Upon release, it's Sunday, February 28th, 2021. The last day of February, which happens to be recognized as the International Rare Disease Day. And we also have a dear friend joining us again in this episode. Before we dive into the conversation, we want to honor and celebrate our friends all over the world who we have come to know over the years, who listen to this show, and who share their rare disease journey with us one way or another. With rare friends all over the globe, we are many, we are strong, and we are proud. We encourage you to visit rarediseaseday.org for more information on this significant day. Dr. Al Friedman is a counseling psychologist and he has a practice in Westchester, Pennsylvania. You might remember him from episode 128, Mental Health and Rare Disease with Dr. Al Friedman. Um, he's a really good friend and he's here with us today. Dr. Al, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Kyle and Sean. I'm honored to be your guest again. So, Dr. Al, before we jump into the main subject, we want to have you do a top five. And today, you let us know that you'd like to give your top five songs. And so, what do we have there? Well, thanks, Kyle. I'll give you five uh, that, that come to mind. And not necessarily in order, but let's right. go with uh, every favorite song list should have a Beatles song. My, my favorite Beatles song is Blackbird. Oh, nice. Another favorite song is uh, the most beautiful song that's less than a minute long by James Taylor. It's called Isn't It Nice to Be Home Again. Less than a minute long? Less than a minute long. You can look it up. All Isn't right. it nice to be home again? I think 57 seconds. A couple of songs. little known fact about Dr. Al is in my last life, I was a bit of a musician. I played... Uh, in, uh, in the horn section and uh, jazz band, rock bands. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite songs, because I got to cover it, Bruce Springsteen, 10th Avenue Freeze Out. Great, uh, great horn parts. Oh, Love nice. Yeah, right. yeah. And a uh, special song by the late, great jazz trumpeter, Dizzy Gillespie. Yeah. You ever heard of him? Dizzy Gillespie, A Night in Tunisia. A Night in Tunisia, a very special song, a famous song, and special to me because I had the actual privilege of being on stage, backing up Dizzy Gillespie in college, playing in a band on stage in, a con in four concerts with Dizzy Gillespie. Nice. So I, wow. I, I, I love that song. Uh, many years ago, but, but it happened. And, uh, and the fifth song, maybe the top one for the purposes of your audience, is uh, not as ancient not new it's a jack johnson song called upside down don't know if you've heard of it oh yeah but uh the lyrics remind me of my son who uses a wheelchair uh who's to say i can't do everything but i can try and as i roll along i begin to find things aren't always just what they seem i want to turn the whole thing upside down and when i heard that song for the first time i pictured my son turning everything upside down, driving that chair, rolling along in his wheelchair with a smile on his face. So for uh, for you guys, I, I thought of that one right away. Jack Johnson, Upside Down. Beautiful. All right. Top five songs from Dr. Al. Thanks so much. Rare Disease Day is today, as we know. And one of the messages is rare is many, 
Rare is strong. Rare is proud. Sean and I were discussing the proud part, and the question is, how does somebody remain proud when they aren't entirely proud of everything about themselves? And of course, we brought in the expert because Kyle and I don't know a thing. So Dr. Al, when you think about rare disease as something that we're proud of, what are, what are some of the first words or, or thoughts that come to your mind? Well, guys, the first, the first thought that comes to my mind is that it may be rare disease day to the world, but every day is rare disease day for those of us who are affected by one. Mm. And we, uh, we don't plan to have a rare disease. And in my case, I didn't plan to have a son with a rare disease. Uh, but our, our lives get flipped upside down one day when we find ourselves in this situation that we didn't expect. And as we discussed during that last episode, when I joined you, it's a very traumatic and disorienting feeling and experience to find yourself in a place you didn't expect to be. So it's, hard to be proud when you're scared. It's hard to be proud when you're disoriented. It's hard to be proud when you're traumatized. It takes time to reorient, find your way into this new world of rare disease. And then over time, incrementally, piece by piece, we kind of reconstruct our lives into a new, to the new reality and work our way towards proud. In my own case, my son Jack, as you may recall, was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy, at the time an untreatable condition, and we were given a year for our son to live. He's 25 now. Uh, he's alive, and he's very capable of doing much more than any of the doctors expected. I am filled with pride at what my son has accomplished I'm filled with pride at what his life has become. And I'm filled with pride at the impact his life has had on other people. And it's my experience working with other families affected by rare disease that we all find our, our we find in our journey um, many challenges. It hasn't been easy by any means. 300 nights in the intensive care unit over 25 years in a wheelchair and feeding tube and ventilator and 24-hour nursing, it's not easy by any means. Right. But we all find our, our way and our journey to strengths and successes. Uh, our, our family members have great gifts that yeah. we don't anticipate. Dr. Al, what, what are the defining things about being proud of, of yourself that, like just in general, won't, won't not specifically referring to rare disease, but how and why is somebody proud of themselves in general? Well, in general, in my experience professionally, I began as a, a school teacher uh, and I worked as a second and third grade school teacher in the Quaker schools here in Pennsylvania. And the philosophy of the schools and my teaching philosophy was to uh, search for and find the strengths in every child I worked with. We all have strengths. We have areas of strength and talent, and we all have areas that are more challenging for us, all of us, every human being, rare disease or not. And we all find our ways to those aspects of ourselves that have strengths. We, we gravitate towards our strengths and our interests in our lives, in our work. And that those strengths and interests lead to uh, accomplishments, achievements, and, and reaching goals that bring us pride in yeah. our successes of uh, rare disease or not. And so, and then as a psychologist trained in counseling psychology, my philosophy and the philosophy of that paradigm of counseling psychology is to start with a person's strengths rather yeah. than to uh, diagnose them with some sort of psychopathology or deficit. So that's the way I think. And that's the way I work. And, we all have strengths that we can build upon that lead us to success and lead us to pride. You know, and it, it occurs to me when somebody has a rare disease, the first thing that somebody may, when they 
you know, come up to them, they may see, oh, this person's in a wheelchair. And the very first thing they do is identify a deficit in that person, right? And and that I think that's part of what you're saying is as people, we can choose what we focus on. We don't need to focus on the fact that we can't walk. Like that doesn't even matter in a lot of cases. We get to focus on what we choose to focus on and we can be people and not just are defined by our disease. We are all people. People with disabilities and rare disease are human beings first. They are not their disease. They're not their condition. We can choose to focus on what we choose to focus on. And when my son drives his wheelchair out in public, prior to pandemic, of course, a lot of the response is, wow, look at how he drives that chair. How does he do that? Because he can't move at all. He's got some fancy electronics. So it, in, in my son's case, there's a strength in how he's able to drive a chair with very, very minuscule movement. That in itself brings pride to him mm. that he can control his physical space and be able to navigate independently in his chair. We can choose to have that attitude. We can choose to draw that attitude toward us, that pride in what we can do, rather than all the things we can't do. So Dr. Al, I, I kind of want to look at um, an area of life that maybe, or I kind of want to look at the angle of this idea of, pride in a slightly different circumstance than what the three of us are used to, right? But uh, with Kyle and I, um, our rare disease developed over time, right? So at one point we knew, or we thought we knew healthy and the ability to run and walk and play baseball and all those things. And then it went away. Yes. We know in your son's case, and in so many other cases, all somebody knows is being born blind or being born without arms or being born with the SMA or some other condition that is present from day one, or I should say the symptoms and the effects of it are present from day one. So how would you help somebody cope with that change right for you it was a uh, all of a sudden change right you went 30 some odd years being just fine then all of a sudden you have a rare disease child so somebody that maybe is in an accident or all of a sudden gets cancer or all of a sudden is paralyzed or all of a sudden is experiencing this change how do you walk somebody through that traumatic experience hoping that little by little they can they can be still be proud of life and move forward, continue moving forward and not uh remain stagnant or or worse, you know, kind of fall into a deep depression for decades or whatever it may be. So would you mind? I mean, not that's probably kind of a hardball, but can you walk through that a little bit? How do you how do you counsel somebody that is dealing with that the newness of it? No, thank you. It's an excellent question, Sean. The the experience psychologically of a person like my son who never was able to walk and never was able to do many things physically is very different than the experience of a person who once can do those physical activities, as an example, and then loses the ability to do what they once could do. That's a different type of psychological experience and a different kind of uh, trauma for people who incrementally lose the ability to do things they have once done. You guys can relate to that. That's, that's, that's part of where your question is coming from. <clears throat> it's a complicated challenge and a different kind of challenge and a different kind of trauma. If what I find is that just as my son and I when we needed to adapt to this change, we sought help and support. And then we received a lot of inspiration from others who've been in our shoes. And it was very hard to find people who could give us hope 
when we were told our baby would die. And it's hard in a different way for people who are losing abilities they once had to not lose hope and to feel positive. My experience is that it's not usually doctors or psychologists or professionals who are most effective at providing the guidance and the support. It's peers, it's other people who've been on the journey and it's other people who have found their ways to adapt and found their strengths and found their coping skills and continue to accomplish whatever they can accomplish at the highest levels. <clears throat> Those are the people who are most helpful to people in situations when they lose something they once had. We parents who give babies like mine, we, we lost something we once had, which was a dream for a healthy child. And people who are born healthy and then lose the ability to walk, they lose something else that's very important at a different time. But I think what we all have in common is inspiration from others who've been in our shoes and others who've paved the way and others who've faced adversity with grace and dignity in different ways that help us to see a path, help us to envision a future for ourselves when it's very hard when we receive news of a diagnosis at whatever time it comes to picture a future for ourselves that can include happiness and include pride. So if there was a suggestion or two that you could give to people, either with a rare disease or in or a disability or even not, just to, about how to be proud of themselves, how to emphasize um, their strengths, as you were saying, what what are those um, one or two or three things that we could tell people to think about or work on? The first thing I would recommend, Kyle, is that every one of us, when we wake up in the morning every day, to start with a moment of reflection and gratitude for the day that's come and for the fact that we're alive and the opportunities that we have and the choices we have on how to use that day, regardless of what the challenges or limitations are that we may face. We all should be grateful to have life, to be on this earth together, and to have each day as it comes to enjoy and to live, to live our lives. Gratitude. If we begin our day and end our day with gratitude, it puts us in the strongest position to be able to take in the positive aspects of the day yep. as well as the challenges. Mm. That's my first, my first that's idea. Huge. Probably most so, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I th that's m speaking to me, you know, that's resonating because it's so easy to focus on what we've lost and forget about maybe small things or big things that we still get, we still have, we still experience. Uh, so I love that that uh, first step, right? That suggestion. So sorry to cut you off, but keep going. You add more. I could feel it. Oh, thanks, Sean. Gratitude goes a long way every day for every human being on this planet. Uh, second is connection. Uh, it's important for all of us, every human being, to have connection with other people, connection with our families, connection with our friends, connection with our loved ones, connections professionally, connections personally. We can't do this alone, this life. It doesn't work well for us to do life alone. And when we make connections, we're energized by other people, their gratitude, their perspective, there are offerings to us that help deepen our experience and help us see ourselves and see our world from different perspectives. And those relationships that we have, mm. the connections we have, go a long way towards feeling pride in being alive and being part of a group. We're all part of a, a group mm. on this earth. And these connections we have with people 
who are important to us are critical to our well-being. Gratitude and connection. It's so simple, right? They're massive things, but it's so easy to, to identify a couple of things you're thankful for and identify a loved one or a good friend or something. Those little, simple little steps that you recommend lead into larger, massive players in a fulfilled life. Yes. So a question for you. Uh, as a rare disease dad, what are you proud of? You know, you, you talked about losing the dream of uh, having healthy children. Uh, today, 25 years later, with Jack, uh, what are, what's a thing or two that you're proud of? Thanks. I'm, there's so many things that I could tell you that make me proud to be Jack's dad and be proud of Jack. He's accomplished so many things, including living 25 years when he wasn't expected to live more than one. But I think what makes me so proud is his own positive attitude and the way he interacts with the world. His, his gifts of bringing compassionate people to his life and to our lives, his gift of bringing out the best in other people uh, wherever he goes whoever path he crosses, he brings out the best in everybody. And I'm proud that he offers the gift of perspective to other people. He drives his wheelchair into the room without saying a word. Everybody's big problems get smaller. His smile is always on his face. He types 20 words a minute without the use of a computer mouse. He has a camera aiming at his left eye. He has 2,000 Facebook friends. He has two part-time jobs. He runs the computer with his left eye really well. He drives his wheelchair independently. He remembers everybody's name and everybody's birthday and wishes everybody a happy birthday on their birthday uh, without Mm. fail. Um, He is an ambassador of goodwill and he's making a difference in the world in his own way. And so in, in despite all of the challenges, all of the physical limitations, all the medical needs he has, all of the challenges we have with having nursing care and uh, medical adventures and equipment and supplies and wheelchair van, and I could go on and on and on. I can't tell you how lucky I feel every single day that he's here, and I can't tell you how lucky I feel every single day that he's accomplished as much as he has and that he's contributing what he is in a very meaningful way to the world around him. You were going through the list of all the things you're proud of and some of these things I, I hadn't heard before. And I was going, man, me, Sean, you're a, you're a slacker, man. Yeah. Right. No, I feel you. He's an all-star. Yeah. It's, it's so cool to hear that list because yeah, like I said, you know, you don't know him. And perception, right? You see this this young man in her chair, he can't move. Most of us probably automatically think there's not a whole lot he can do. And I love hearing that. And I think that's a walk of life or a kind of a, a common uh, hurdle for all of us in the disease space. You know, people see our kids stumbling or maybe see a child who can't hold themselves up or you know, see whatever the disability is and they automatically think, oh, he'll, you know, that child won't be able to hold the job. They won't be able to go to, you know, class or or who knows. But to hear that list and to hear that he's accomplished so many things despite uh, his his disabilities and his conditions, it's in a way it's encouraging, right? There's so much more. And we've said it all the time. There's so much more to life than that disability or this disease or that one. And I love that you, you've helped us and our listeners put it in perspective a little bit today. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, uh, very encouraging. Uh, with, uh, you know, some exceptions, like when Jack got to high school and dad couldn't help him with his 
trigonometry homework because it was too hard for dad. <laughs> but, uh, I love that too. Uh, but like any other dad, the math got too hard for me to help him with his homework. He was yeah. doing X squared and Y to the third power over Z with his left eye as the mouse and banging <laughs> out Excel spreadsheets and doing all kinds of crazy stuff that I still don't know how to do. So that got discouraging, oh. but everything else is really proud of him. Yeah. You know, we were talking to Roger Crawford. Um, he's a disabled tennis player. I don't know if I brought this up in our last conversation, but you know, he was, he was like, you know what? Think of people that seemingly have it worse than you and think of all the stuff that they've accomplished. And, you know, for me, I think of Christopher Reeve. I mean, he could not move at all. I read his book. He worked for months just to move his finger. And think of all the things he accomplished after he was injured. Yeah, sure. He was Superman. And he, he was a great actor before he was injured. But think of all the stuff he accomplished after he was injured. I think it's much like your son jack is when when we focus on those strengths there's a long list i mean there's no reason to even think about the deficits right some in in a certain respect because the list of strengths is so long that's right i i, I over these years i've i've come to realize guys that, that there's a long list of challenges and problems and medical vulnerabilities, life-threatening situations. It's a long, long list. And I've come to think that because Jack has these other gifts that are so special, the gifts that I just mentioned before, of how he brings people together, brings people up in attitude, helps bring out the best in people, gives people perspective. These are pretty unusual and special gifts. To be a magnet for warm-hearted, compassionate people, only good people, are attracted to Jack. We're surrounded by amazing people. He's got some really unusual gifts. And I've come to believe that in order for Jack and people like him to give their gifts to the world, they require a whole lot of special care and attention. They're very precious gifts that he has. So I've started to think that, 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 that there's a logic to the long list on both sides of the equation. He needs a lot of special care and a lot of unusual attention medically in order to be able to sustain his life and give the gifts that he does to the world. That there, There's something about that that 25 years later I'm starting to see. It's a, it's a stretch from where I was 25 years ago, but uh, there's something to that that I'm starting to see about people like my son. They require a lot of attention and care, but they sure give a lot back. I can see that you don't see those things as a burden, as a something that you weren't expecting in something bad that's in your life. It seems like you see them all, all the things, all the extra care that Jack needs as just a necessary part of sharing his gifts with the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's part of it. And I think part of it is, I'm just used to all this medical craziness at this point. Like when I'm chasing him through the mall, I don't even see the wheelchair anymore. It's just part of who Jack is. I have to be reminded by the looks on other people's faces that my son isn't typical. Other people's responses to him bring me back to, oh, I guess this isn't normal, but it's normal yeah. to me after this mm. many years. And so there's a, there's a, an evolution that happens, a developmental process that we all have when we're in the in the worlds that we live in, where we get more and more used to a situation that's unusual, and then we can forget that it's unusual. And I see this all the time in my practice with clients. They come to me asking for help uh, to make a, a, a change in their life. Something's off, and they're not sure why. And Oftentimes, they've just grown accustomed to a quality of life or a pattern or a habit that they don't call into question anymore. They don't see it. So you need somebody from the outside to help you see it. That's what I do in my counseling work mm -hmm. with people who come to me. And that's what those looks on other people's faces at the mall bring me back to, oh, 
what I'm doing chasing this boy through the mall in a wheelchair isn't what everybody else is doing. You know, yeah. mm. of that. it's a, it's a, a unusual and beautiful experience 25 years later, but it hasn't been easy. It's, it's not how I felt 25 years ago or uh, 20 years ago or 15. It takes time to adapt and to be, be proud of the life you have rather than the mm. life you could have had. Dr. Al, while you were uh, finishing up your last response and Kaya was asking the question or throwing it out what he just did, what dawned on me or came to mind were all the parents that listen to our show that might feel like they have more bad days than you. So I've got another probably strong question for you or a heavy hitter. Yeah, bring it on. I want to be somewhat raw. There are days where uh, it's a struggle, right? We're sad. We're brokenhearted. We wish things were different, especially those parents that maybe are kind of new to the rare disease community or even that adult patient that's new to the rare disease community. How would you encourage them in those moments of despair and feelings of wanting to uh, maybe give up or, or not keep going or, you know, however you want to phrase it, we know there are some really tough days uh, that so many people experience. And we know there's going to be more tough days, right? So how would you encourage families or folks to work through those, those periods? Oh, thank you, Sean. And I, I counsel many families who have babies and young children newly diagnosed with the rare disease, and they're at the front end of this process and feel like I did on November 7th, 1995. You never forget that day when your life changes your life gets completely flipped upside down and you don't know that you're going to survive the experience. You don't know what to do. You're, you're totally without hope. Um, I remember that. I'll never forget it. And every family I counsel who's at that starting point brings me back to that time. I think to answer your question, uh, Sean, the, the very first thing that I try to help a parent to do in this situation with a new diagnosis or a surprise, a medical surprise on their hands, is to reassure them that they will come through this experience whole, hmm. regardless of the outcome. I didn't know that when my son was diagnosed. I asked myself how I would live through the experience myself, losing a child. And I got the best help from other parents who had been in the same situation and who had lost their babies and who help me to know that I could come through the experience whole. And they demonstrated that because they were walking and talking in sentences and sane and living productive lives without their child. To me, they were and still are heroes. So the first thing you need is hope. Hope that you can come through the experience whole. Hope that you'll have help hope that you'll regain your bearings. And what I encourage people to do is to put one foot in front of the other and to take one day at a time by staying in the present and enjoying, again, that gratitude every morning for what we do have and to do anything we can that day to make it through that day in one piece to get to the next day and work from a place of trauma and loss towards a place of wholeness over time by reconstructing our, our lives around this new situation that none of us expected. Uh, we could do 10 episodes on this. Uh, this is a, a, a long process. And I too have had many rough days, a month at a time in the intensive care unit in life and death situations. Um, rough times when nurses don't show up and I'm up all night to this day just this morning, uh, snowstorm, and can the nurse get here? And 
getting up at five o'clock in the morning and making sure the snow plow can clear the driveway so that the nurses can get in out safely and making sure that I'm prepared to take care of Jack if they can, day and night. It's not easy to live with uncertainty 25 years later. I'm still living on the edge some days. So I appreciate the question, Sean. I hope that's helpful to start. Absolutely. I think it's all been very helpful. Just to provide your perspective, it's invaluable, you know, with your training and then with your experience, which is probably more valuable. And we're so grateful to Jack that he has made you the person you are. And through you, he is able to affect so many people. That's just amazing. So thank you for being with us again today. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. And yeah, a member of the clergy once told me that Jack's the minister. I'm just the messenger. Yep, it's clear. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to share his story and to support other families and rare disease organizations who do so much, as you guys do, to help all of our families and for us to be able to help each other. I feel lucky that Jack's taught me some important things that allow me to help, and I'm grateful to be part of this conversation with with you, Kyle and Sean. Dr. Al, thank you so much. Um, Today is a rare disease day, and we want to speak partly to all of our rare disease friends. And if they heard something on here today, you know, our conversation with you where they're like, you know what, there's something in my life, in my head, in in my everyday that I want to work on. How would they reach out to you and, and see what you're doing as far as counseling? Oh, thank you. Anybody in the rare disease community is welcome to reach out to me. And I can be found on Facebook, I can be found on LinkedIn, and I can be found most directly by email um, at al at FriedmanCounseling.com, F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N Counseling.com. Once again, Dr. Al, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kyle. Sean, I love our conversations with Dr. Al. He brings such perspective and always there's a tidbit that I bring away from every conversation with him that I'm going to think about. And one of the things he talked about today was gratitude. And that's something that we like to show at the end of every one of our episodes. Today, I want to thank whoever it was that cleaned the snow off of my car like twice in the last few oh, weeks. Wow. It's yeah, we've we've had a few pretty gnarly storms here in the Philadelphia area and I went out to the parking lot and all the cars around had a bunch of snow on them and there was none on mine and I, and it felt really good to know that somebody was there looking out for me. Thank you. Hmm. I wonder if that person is like watching from their window to see if you're like who touched my car or if it's oh somebody touched my car like are you getting angry are you grateful or what so uh maybe they listen to the show and yeah they feel the warmth of your gratitude there hopefully i have no idea who did this but i want to say thank you to whoever invented the handheld shower head i think that's a brilliant and genius, and it comes in really handy, especially for those of us who might use a shower chair or, yep. you know, don't have the ability and the freedom to move around as nimbly. I don't think that's a word yeah. either, but you get the idea. I yeah. love the handheld shower heads. If you if you can't move to the, the shower head... Make the shower head move to you, man. (laughs) (laughs) Make it work for you. So with that, I'm thankful to you and Dr. Al, of course, for a wonderful episode. And I'm thankful for another opportunity to share with our listeners. I want to remind everybody, visit reddiseasday.org. 
You can also look in our show notes. You'll find a link there. We're grateful for the rare disease community and we hope everybody is wearing those stripes with pride. We look forward to chatting with everybody again soon. Until then, keep living with urgency. Thank you for listening to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. This show is possible with your support. Visit twodisabledudes.com to donate. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app.